do it. Amara? Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order at 7 o'clock p.m. on Monday, September the 15th, and certainly want to welcome all of you that are here with us this evening. If we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. Uh, this evening, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Councilman Eddie Davis to introduce uh, the young men who are going to be presenting. Pledge. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we are honored to have uh, several members of Troop 137 from St. Joseph's AME Church on Fayetteville Street, and they will lead us in the pledge. Councilman Brown, your job yeah, might yeah. be, <laughs> unless you get a uniform, you might be in, in jeopardy. <laughs> well, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, ask the clerk if she would call the roll, please. Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Present. Councilmember Brown. Yeah. Councilmember Katati. Yeah. Councilmember Davis. Yeah. Councilmember Moffitt. Yeah. And Councilmember Shule. Uh, this evening we have uh, three proclamations to present. The first one recognizes National Disability Employment Awareness Month, and I would ask the Ms. Sarah Hogan, Is this Sarah? Yeah, okay. Manager of Durham Parks and Recreation, Esther Coleman, Employment Program Coordinator, OEWD, uh, Marge Walters Clemens, Chair of the Mayor's Committee for Persons with Disabilities, uh, Deborah Giles, Director and Jennifer Lunsford, Lentf Program Assistant, Equal Opportunity and Equity Assurance Department. If you would, would join us, please, at the podium. Thank you. <laughs> Whereas the month of October has been designated by the United States Congress as National Disability Employment Awareness Month, whereas Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 and the Washington Law Against Discrimination promote independence, empowerment, and quality of life, whereas workplaces welcoming the talents of all people, including people with disabilities, are a critical part of our efforts to build an exclu inclusive community and strong economy, whereas we, as we consistently work to break down barriers and work together to ensure that people with disabilities can participate fully in the workplace in all aspects of community life, 
Whereas we must continue to work for a community where all individuals are respected for who they are, celebrated for their abilities, and encouraged to realize their full potential and achieve their dreams, and whereas the City of Durham celebrates National Disability Employment Awareness Month through numerous events, including Disabled the Label, an event hosted by the Durham Parks and Recreation and many partner agencies, and this is done on Saturday, October the 4th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Holton Career and Resource Center, and an employee recognition program hosted by the Mayor's Committee for Persons with Disabilities to honor employers who hire persons with disabilities on Thursday, October the 23rd at 6 p.m. in the City Council Chambers. Now, therefore, I, William A. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim October 2014 as National Disability Employment Awareness Month in Durham, and hereby urge all to take special note of this observance by joining together and reaffirming our determination to achieve a society that affords independence, justice, and dignity for all. I witness my hand, Corporate Civil City of Durham, North Carolina. This is the 15th day of September 2014. I'll present this to Ms. Hogan. Whoever wants to take it. <laughs> I am Marge Clemens. I'm the chair for the Mayor's Committee for Person Disability. I would like to give honor and respect to our mayor, William V. Bill Bell, and our city council members. Sincerely and graciously, I want to say thank you to you and our manager, city managers, and department heads for your continued support of the Mayor's Committee for Persons with Disability. The committee has become more involved with the city and county departments, community agencies, and outreach advocacies who can assist us with getting the right information and resource out into the community who has for this assist assistance. Thank you so much for your strong, enhanced support. We really appreciate it each and every day and every year. You always do something for us. And I want to say to the community, we have the best, the best mayor and city council. Thank you very much. God bless you. I'm, S I'm Sarah Hogan. I'm a recreation manager with the city of Durham Parks and Recreation Department. And it's my pleasure to work in a city where people are valued, where people of all abilities, races, um, economic conditions are part of our community and the fabric of our lives here. Um, the Parks and Recreation Department is very busy, and, and this year um, I wanted to just give you a few updates, hopefully very, very briefly, about what we've been working on. Um, we continue to work with general services to ensure that our facilities are accessible, working to ensure that at least one of each type of facility, the ball fields, tennis courts, dog parks, and fishing and boating areas are accessible. Um, we'll soon be working with General Services on the project out at Lake Mickey to make that pier and um, boating area accessible. We'll continue to work on ensuring that our information is accessible both to our public and to our staff and working with our marketing and public affairs staff to ensure that the message um, that all are welcome is clear. This summer, the summer of 2014, we served 64 children and youth, ch youth and teens, um, included into our traditional programs, um, these were youth that had disabilities or teens that had disabilities, that were included in our traditional summer camps. In addition to that number of 64, we served an additional 39 youth and teens in our special programs camps. Now that number's down slightly from last year, but what we think is that as people become accustomed to being served, they don't necessarily identify themselves as often. So. We are not um, at all concerned. We think we, we are still doing an excellent job. And as we include people, they're just becoming part of the program and we don't necessarily identify them um, as, um, as having a disability. Uh, we continue to adapt our, our programs um, and increase the assistance we offer to patrons toward traditional services, adapted aquatics toward traditional swim lessons, adapted fishing toward our community opportunities, um, like we mentioned, Lake Mickey's Pier being, um, being upgraded, and the special program summer camps and after school programs, moving folks who are ready and willing to more traditional type uh, school age care programming. During our programs, we evaluate um, how we're doing, and one of the questions we've been asking for the last year and a half is, 
if you have a special need which requires an accommodation, was an appropriate one provided? And so we've been tracking that, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that our numbers continue to improve over time. Over the past six months, we've looked at our mature adult program evaluations. We had one person um, out of about 126, one person say they were disappointed with what we did with accommodating their needs. We had two that said we did a pretty good job, but there were still some things we should have done. We had 24 people say that they were happy, that we gave them what they needed and they were pleased. We had 126 people who said they didn't really need an accommodation and therefore they didn't really need to answer the question. For our summer programs, and this includes our events, our summer camps, our general programming, we had one person say they were disappointed. So the inclusion efforts or accommodation efforts that we were making didn't meet their needs. We had two people who said that, yeah, we, we did some things that were right, but there were still more we, we could have or should have done. We had 40 people say that, yes, we provided well for their needs. And so we're real happy with those numbers. Certainly we have not arrived, but it's a good journey and we're on our way. The last thing, of course, is to um, make you aware that as I stood here last year and talked about some grants we received, we've used those funds. The arthritis um, foundation grant we got for Walk with Ease was a $4,000 grant. We got about this time last year. We rolled out the program in January and served 56 persons who had uh, joint or mobility issues in that program. And the funds will allow us to continue the program into the future. Materials, staff training, and our resources to continue to provide that service. This is the fifth year we've done our Challenger Flag Football League. And again, this year we got funding from the Carolina Panthers to provide those services. And that actually kicked off last weekend. Lastly, as you've seen on the monitor, we're doing the Disable the Label event this weekend. And this is a name change. It was formerly Unity in the Community. We had some confusion in the community about what that meant or who that was for. So we borrowed a name um, from someone else who gave it to us freely. It's Disable the Label. So we're going to dis the label and, and, and enable it. And that event is on Saturday, October the 4th from 11 to 2 at the Holton Career Resource Center. There's information in the back if anyone would like to um, take that with you. It's a free event open to the public. And we just would love for you to join us. Thank you so much. Thank you. I guess that's just... Uh, another indication uh, of how we strive very hard to be a very inclusive community in all aspects. Uh, our next proclamation is National Hispanic Heritage Month and Delilah Donaldson, the manager of Human Relations Division, Homer Vargas, chair, Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee, see available. I know Pilar is not here. She's the director of El Centro. She's out of the country. Uh, Rosalie Bosselli Hernandez is a committee member. Annabelle Rosa, also a committee member. And Maria Padilla, a committee member. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. It was not very good. Uh, the proclamation reads, where is National Hispanic Heritage Month? It's celebrated from September 15th through October 15th, and is a time of celebration and appreciation of the rich cultural, tradition, and numerous contributions made in our communities. Whereas the theme for Hispanic Heritage Month 2014 is Hispanics, a legacy of history, a present of action, and a future of successes. Where is recognized a positive impact that our Hispanic communities have on the social, cultural, and economic development statewide and nationwide, whereas today many Hispanic Americans are thriving but others are still struggling to overcome obstacles, including language and cultural barriers as well as discrimination, whereas the city of Durham is committed to seeking to improve existing opportunities and to open new doors for Hispanic and Latino residents in the city of Durham. Now therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do have our proclaim September 15, 2014 through October 15, 2014 as National Hispanic Heritage Month in Durham. And hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance 
witness my hand, corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina. This is the 15th day of September, 2014. I'm going to present this to Delilah, and I'm sure she will introduce others. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mayor Bell. Um, I would like to turn this over to uh, Yalima Vargas, who will provide a few brief remarks. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all of you for being here tonight. Um, I would like to share something very short with you uh, in commemoration of the Hispanic Na National Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, I would like to thank the city council, and especially Mayor Bill Bell for this proclamation. Although there is so much work to get done towards the growth and integration of the Hispanic Latino community in Durham, it is clear that the city is working diligently to change our shortcomings and to build our strengths as a city and more importantly, as a community. Although frustrating at times, change always takes time. Patience, but most of all, a clear and a strong sense of unity and purpose for the common good. I'm here tonight to celebrate with my colleagues and with each of you the contributions that the Hispanic Latino community has provided to the great nation over the years, which is the United States. We're very proud to be part of this community and we want to continue being part of this great community. This is what diversity is really about. Tonight and with this proclamation, we must welcome integration, respect, fairness, growth, and of course, a lot of colors and no e an easy task many times for sure, but a great challenge for a vibrant and proud city such as Durham. Uh, I thank you one, one more time for your time and for opening to a great diversity and a great, op great opportunity for Durham. There is a lot to be done, like I said before, but I'm very proud of being part of this city. I'm proud of being Latina, but also I'm proud of being a, a Durham resident. Um, I also want to thank everyone who came tonight, tonight with us, Jose Alegria representing the, the Centro Hispano as well, and thank you so much. Have a great night. And at this time, I would like for each uh, one of the uh, participants uh, to just give their name and um, the agency that they're with and also the country that they represent. I am Maria Inés Roballo from Colombia, and I am a community member. I am Anabel Rosa. I am an attorney working and living in Durham, and originally from Puerto Rico. Good evening, everyone. Jose Alegria from Mexico, social worker working with El Centro Hispano. Rosalie Bocelli, I'm from Puerto Rico. I work in the city of Durham in parks and recreation. Okay, and lastly, we would like to just make you aware of Hispanic Latino events that are going on in the city. Um, the City of Durham Human Relations Division of the NIS Department will celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month on Wednesday, October the 15th from 12 noon to 1.30 p.m. And the program will take place in the committee room upstairs uh, here in City Hall. And you are all invited to attend. If you plan to attend, uh, you would need to RSVP no later than October the 10th by calling our office at 919-560-4107 or you can email Juanita English at Juanita.English at DurhamNC.gov. And I'd like to call Rosalie up, talk about her event. Yes, we would like to invite all of you for the Latino Festival. It's going to be held in Rock Quarry Park this upcoming, this Saturday night, the next one, on September 27, 12 to 5 p.m. in Rock Quarry Park, 701 Stadium Drive. Live music and entertainment featuring Tercer Divisa, Orquesta Caché, Estrellas Calentanas, y Flamenco Vivo. We will invite all of you to be with us and dance with us. Thank you. Uh, this is a good night. Another example of the city trying to be as inclusive as possible in all aspects. Uh, last, I'd like to present a proclamation, proclamation recognizing Schoolhouse of Wonder. And I would ask um, Mike Gully chairman of the Board of Schoolhouse of Wonder, 
and Wendy Tonker, the executive director, if they would both join me, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, the proclamation reads, where it's October the 5th, 2014, marks the 25th anniversary of Schoolhouse of Wonder, serving families in the city of Durham, and where Schoolhouse of Wonder leverages hands-on, nature-based adventures to nurture children to become their most kind, curious, and confident selves, where Schoolhouse of Wonder engages 4,000 children, ages 3 through 17, each year through their three principal program areas, they are outdoor day camps, outdoor field trips, and leadership training, where Schoolhouse of Wonder programs are anchored in their core values, those core values being modeling and teaching self-awareness and empathy, celebrating individuality, difference is just a different, witnessing, hearing, and respecting each person, appreciating nature as the best classrooms, and sending every kid home dirty, <laughs> tired, and happy where Schoolhouse of Wonder introduces thousands of children and their families each year to the beauty of the Eno River and teaches them the importance of preserving our community's natural resources, whereas the City of Durham Department of Parks and Recreation has served as a vital partner with Schoolhouse of Wonder since 1989, whereas anyone so desiring can learn more about Schoolhouse of Wonder by visiting its website at www.schoolhouseofwonder.org now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do have our proclaim October 5, 2014, as Schoolhouse of Wonder Day in the City of Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take a special note of Schoolhouse of Wonder's contributions to our community and to participate in these programs. And witness my hand, Corporate Steel of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the 15th day of September 2014. I'm going to present this to Mike and uh, the comments that you might have. On behalf of the Board of Directors, I'd like to thank Mayor Bell, members of the City Council, and citizens of Durham for supporting Schoolhouse of Wonder. We'd also like to encourage, acknowledge the vision and commitment of our founders, Dave Cook and Wayne Poole, and our first Executive Director, Karen Kelly, and recently retired Park Manager, Beth Hiley, for the sacrifices they made to establish the strong foundation upon which we were built. We feel very fortunate to have such a strong collaboration with the City of Durham, especially with the Department of Recs, Recs Department of Rec and Parks and Recreation for our entire 25 years of service. We would especially like to thank Rhonda Parker, the Director of the Parks and Recreation Department, for your effective leadership and for being such a supportive partner. We look forward to the many more years of serving the community together. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Mayor and City Council. Um, we are excited to, with this partnership because the City of Durham is all about partnerships and because we can't serve everyone by ourselves. And we have share a, a similar mission to introduce young people to nature and especially at our beautiful West Point on the City Park, West Point on the Eno City Park. So we're excited to continue this partnership with Schoolhouse of Wonder and we're excited that you're celebrating your 25 years of existence and I'd like to introduce to you Wendy Tonker who is the executive director and has been um, the executive director since 2011. Thank you Wendy. My name is Wendy Tonker I'm the executive director at Schoolhouse of Wonder. Um, I'd like to thank Ms. Parker, uh, Mr. Ford who's the current park manager at West Point on the Eno, uh, Mayor Bell and City Council members for your support of Schoolhouse over the last 25 years. We love being outside with kids. There's nothing we love more. And kids are spending less and less time outside today than they did when I was younger and perhaps when some of you um, were younger. We, um, one of our points of emphasis over these past few years is to reach a broader spectrum of kids from all socioeconomic uh, walks of life. And I'm really pleased to share that just this year so far, we've been able to, um, with the support of mostly individual donors from Durham, uh, offer more than 40 week-long camp scholarships uh, to children from Durham and the surrounding area. And with ongoing support from the city and the mayor and Parks and Recreation, um, we look forward to extending that reach uh, well beyond 50 uh, each and every year into the future. Uh, so thank you for your support. We're looking forward to the next 25 years.
Mr. Mayor, while you're taking your seat, I'll say that my daughter has attended uh, some of the camps at Schoolhouse of Wonder, and they do indeed send them home tired, dirty, and happy. That's great. I, I, I was impressed when Wendy got up to speak. She had these little notes, and I, I said, she go read that? Because I, I have big letters, but you, you, you did it from heart, so you didn't have to use your notes. I, that's what I was impressed with. If you, if you had read those things, I said, wow, they got good eyes, too. Okay, let me ask other priority items by the first body, Deputy City Manager. Mr. Mayor, uh, the manager has no priority items this evening. Uh, likewise, uh, City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, no priority items. And likewise, Madam City Clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Well, if I can get my system working here, I guess we can get started. Are there announcements by members of the council? I recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, I want to take the opportunity tonight uh, to uh, actually two things sort of spontaneously. The first is, is that we recently had a number of promotions in the police department, and I want to acknowledge all the people who were promoted, but in particular, the former Captain Sarvis, who's now Assistant Chief Sarvis, who's here, and just congratulate you, and um, it's good to see you. And also, I just want to take a moment and say that um, I, one of the things I love about Durham there's so many people doing so many different things, and many of them uh, doing them quietly. And one of them um, is here tonight, and has no idea that I was going to say this, but uh, he was in a Peace Corps, I don't know, two decades ago or longer, in Africa, in Sierra Leone. And uh, during the Civil War, he lost contact with the village that he'd been with. He worked hard to make contact with them again. And he's um, started a nonprofit called Africa Yes. And through that nonprofit, mostly through his own, his own efforts and his own, um, the, the, you know, the finances of himself and his family, he's worked to provide support for the village. And uh, even now, uh, when they're now working for, you might have seen an article in the paper uh, about Ebola, and the village itself is going out and working in the region, and they're getting support on like manuals and what to do through the contacts that, um, that Steve Cameron, Steve's here and I just wanted to acknowledge him and um, thank him for the work that he's doing for the, for the world. Thanks. Thank you. Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. I just want to acknowledge uh, again the achievement of a young woman from Durham, North Carolina. Her name is Elmira Mangum. She was reared in Walltown, is a product of the Durham City Schools, is a graduate of the great university called North Carolina Central, right here in Durham. She is going to be inaugurated on my birthday, a national holiday, October 3rd, at Florida A&M University. What an honor it is. And what I want to do is to somehow make October 3rd, um, her day in Durham, and I'm going to try to go to uh, Tallahassee as a representative of her city uh, on that special day. So we'll need to make that happen. We are just so blessed um, that, um, that this is happening to uh, Elmira and other women who are heading or leading uh, universities, Dr. Sanders White at the NCCU and the young woman who, from Morehouse, Mayor Bill, who's at uh, Elizabeth City State University. She's also from Howard. Howard, Howard. Excuse, Howard. Me, Howard. excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. So Howard, Howard. Right. I don't yeah. know where I saw. Yeah. Okay, but anyway, it's just a blessing to see women uh, leading universities and they are gonna be much greater than they've ever been. I can feel it, thank you, sir. You're quite welcome. And I, since you have mentioned that, I'd uh, like to recognize Councilman Davis because he has a, a relationship with this young lady. For any comments you might want to add, and tell him what your relationships are. Well, um, Mayor Pro Tem has known her a lot longer, but uh, she is an in-law. My, she's my wife's first cousin. If not, we'll proceed with the consent agenda. And as usual, I'll just read each heading and 
Uh, if someone pulls it either on the city council or on the public, we will discuss it later. Item one is approval of city council minutes. Item two is Durham Open Space and Trails Commission appointments. Item three is the Durham Housing Authority Board of Commissioners appointment. Item four is Audit Services Oversight Committee appointment. Item seven is award of dedicated housing funds to Vermilion Homestead LLC, a 60 unit affordable rental townhome community. Item nine is North Carolina Department of Transportation Schedule A and Schedule B municipal agreements. Item 10 is resolution authorizing city auction. Item 11 is selection of third party administrator for workers' compensation and general liability adjusters. Item 12 for the third amendment to assignment agreement between the city of Durham and the Durham Bulls Baseball Club for the operation of the Durham Athletic Park. Item 13 is FY 2015 contract between the city of Durham and Center for Documentary Studies. Item 14 is Greater Durham Chamber of Commerce Legacy Foundation Grant Project Ordinance. Item 15 is 2014-2016 Job Driven National Emergency Grant Project Ordinance. Item 13 is acceptance of a grant from the North Carolina Horse Council. Item 20 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. Item 21 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda as a public hearing. Entertain a motion for the approval of consent agenda items as read. Second. It's been properly moved by Mayor Pro Tem, second by Councilwoman Katati. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Moving to the general business agenda, 2014 second quarter crime summary report. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, ladies and gentlemen of the council, city attorney. My name is Larry Smith, and I'm here to present the second quarter report, which is also the first six months of the 2014, and I'm the deputy chief of operations. This report covers the department's six performance measures. This report covers the department's six performance measures, violent crime, property crime, part one index crime, clearance rates, response times to priority one calls, and staffing levels. The executive summary also includes additional information about significant accomplishments and highlights during the first quarter. First, we'll talk about part one violent crime, which includes homicide, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault. Part one violent crime is up 30% from this time in 2013. However, homicides are at a three year low. Part one violent crime accounted for approximately 15% of all part one crime during the first six months of 2014. The numbers that go along with that are as follows. Homicide is down 23%, rapes up 11, robberies up seven, and aggravated assault up 50% for a total increase of violent crime over the first six months of 2013 of 30%. The rise in violent crime has been driven by a 50% increase in the number of reported aggravated assaults. There have been an upsurge in the number of shootings into occupied homes and vehicles this year. In many cases, there were multiple potential victims. Our aggravated assault statistics are calculated by the number of victims, not the number of incidents. The number of incidents has actually risen 32%, while the number of victims is up 50%. Our violent incident response team investigates all instances involving shooting into residences and vehicles. They gather intelligence to help investigators learn more about motives and possible suspects and to assist district commanders in targeting patrol areas. We also work closely with our federal ATF task force to file federal gun charges when appropriate. Next is part one property crime which includes burglary, larceny, and motor vehicle theft. Property crime is up 8% over the first six months of 2013. However, motor vehicle theft is at a three year low. Part one property crime made up approximately 85% of all part one crimes during the first half of 2014. Larcenies accounted for more than half or 52% of all part one crime. And the numbers that 
go along with that are as follows. Burglary is up 16%, larceny is 6%, motor vehicle theft down 15% for an increase in property crime of 8% over the first six months of 2013. For a total index crime increase in the first six months of 11%. We are continuing to do our residential awareness program to focus on residential burglaries. Excuse me, shoplifting accounted for 29% of our larcenies during the first six months of the year. We have one investigator who focuses on shoplifting who works closely with other investigators across the Triangle area. Recently, many of our commanders also met with the management of some of the locations where many of our shopliftings are occurring. Larcenies from vehicles and theft of vehicle parts and accessories make up approximately 37% of our larcenies. We continue to encourage people not to leave items such as purses and electronics in plain view in their vehicles. Next is clearance rates. Our clearance rates for the first six months of 2014 are above the FBI national average for cities in all categories except aggravated assault and overall violent crime. The lower than average aggravated assault clearance rate caused the drop in the violence crime clearance rate. We recently met with our, with our investigators to focus on what may be causing this drop in clearance of especially aggravated assault. We're looking at issues such as repeat offenders, lack of cooperation by victims, and investigators' caseload. Next is response to Priority 1 calls. There were 5,375 Priority 1 calls from July 1, 2013 through June 30, 2014. We did not meet our target of responding to 57% of Priority 1 calls in under five minutes. Rather, we responded to 52.4% in under five minutes. We did not meet our target of 5.8 minute average response time. Rather, our average response time was 5.95 minutes. Next is staffing levels. Our sworn ranks are fully staffed at this time. However, there are 24 operational vacancies. There are 14 non-sworn vacancies at the end of the second quarter, and there are currently 17 non-sworn vacancies. Finally, we'll move into some of the second quarter community events. I'd like to share photos from some of the many community events in which the Durham Police Department participated in the second quarter. On April 25th, officers from the Durham Police Department attended the Durham County Special Olympics games at the Durham, County, Durham Academy Upper School. Officers cheered on and encouraged the athletes. Also on May 29th, officers from the Durham Police Department and North Carolina Central University participated in the law enforcement torch run to raise money for the North Carolina Special Olympics. The route covered 11 miles from Durham Police Headquarters to Glenwood Avenue to Briar Creek Parkway. This year, the police department raised more than $5,800 for the North Carolina Special Olympics through the torch run and the April 11th Tops on, Cop, Cops on Top event at Chick-fil-A restaurants at Hillsborough Road and Roxborough Road. Also, our District 3 officers held a mental health awareness and child safety Celebrate Life, Celebrate Community event on May 31st at Forest Hills Park. Several agencies provided mental health and safety information, and there were food and games for everyone. The event was a successful partnership between the police department and the community and Officer Michael Antonides' Neighborhood Portfolio Exercise Project. Officers from District 4D and members of our Citizens Observer Patrol met with residents at Common Grounds meeting at Koinonia Coffee House on South Miami Boulevard. This provided a relaxed setting for officers and residents to get to know each other better. Also in the second quarter, we began what we call our conversations with congregations. In June, several members of the police department spoke with more than 100 members of the River Church about the Durham Police Department's many community outreach programs and initiatives. And finally, Project Safe, Safe, Project Safe Neighborhood started to launch its Citizen Strong Durham campaign at the end of the second quarter. The campaign highlights the critical role of community members in reducing violent crime in our city. We hope that through a variety of easy to implement strategies, citizens can decrease property crime and even more importantly, violent crime. Some of these crime prevention tips have included reporting graffiti to the Durham Impact Team, talking with parents and friends about safe, fi securing firearms safely when children are visiting, communicating with your children, calling 911 to report, report suspicious activity, and to getting to know your neighbors. And this concludes the report and also you have an executive summary and I'll entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you, Chief. I recognize first the Mayor Pro Tem. 
Thank you for that uh, report. Yes, ma'am. Uh, <clears throat> throughout the city, I am receiving reports from citizens about gunshots. What can be done to lessen the occurrence? As far uh, what as are we doing? What well, are you doing? Not well, education is the, is the most important key to lessen gunshots. Uh, it, it, we, we deal with celebratory gunfire in particular when it comes around the holidays. But our concern is those gunshots that result in somebody being shot or something being shot. And that's where it, it's important in our investigations when we make arrests and also for our citizens to call when they hear gunshots. Unfortunately, I think it's, all too, it's gotten all too commonplace in some places that some neighborhoods hear gunshots and they don't call. And so we encourage everyone, if you hear what you think is gunshots in your neighborhood, to call. Because we don't know what that'll be until we get down there. Noticed um, um, uh, an increase in my own neighborhood because my neighbors were sharing that information. And Larry, I mean, excuse me, Chief, can I have, uh, let me have the non emergency number again to make sure my people get that. 560 zero, right. 4600. Zero, zero. 4600. Zero, zero. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it, it's becoming a real problem. Yeah, and, the, and oftentimes we do want, I think sometimes people are reluctant to call, especially in certain neighborhoods, they think it might be fireworks. But it could be gunshots. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so, so call. Yeah, Our well, they saw call. some shells. Well, then that was definitely uh, in, in firearms. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Chief, I, could you spend a little bit more time again on the violent crime. I mean, obviously, it's not moving in a direction, at least that I like to see. I don't think anyone else would. And I understand this is a six-month report. It is. So in terms of trending, we're almost into uh, third quarter now, fourth quarter, I guess, close to, close, close to it. What, what is it looking like? Well, we're trending in the right direction. I mean, obviously, we're concerned about these numbers as well. But it, as of September 6, our violent crime statistics was rather than 30 percent is up to 2.98 so under 23 property up 5.63 and and so for an index crime increase of 7.9 rather than 11. Okay. so so we're moving in the right direction as it relates to this report uh, we have made a couple significant arrests we've seen a and after one of those arrests in particular that i won't share here because we're still following up on some of the information we've seen a drastic decrease in the number of houses shot uh, because of some of the retaliatory and back and forth violence and we're hoping to get some more information uh, from that particular arrest that can help us possibly uh, clear some others. And could you go back again and just repeat how aggravated assaults are counted when you said victims? I mean, doesn't well, you can go ahead and tell what that yeah, means. Yes, sir. So how an aggravated assault is counted, if somebody fired a shot through that window right there, and anyone in this room who could have been hit by that round, that's that many number of victims. So maybe not you all, but everybody sitting here, including myself, so that would be... 35 aggravated assaults. That's not happening that often, but what is happening is someone fires a round into a house or shoots at a house, there's four or five people in there, that's five aggravated assaults. So it's counted by the potential victim, not by the incident. And it's potential victims. That's correct. Not necessarily someone who's gotten hit. I mean, it's that's right, fact, potential victims. If no one got hit in the house, if the round comes through and no one got hit and five people could have been hit, it's five aggravated okay. assaults. I just think that's helpful to clarify when you see a number like well, and it, it, you know, it's not just, you know, we've got a bit of a troubling trend going on in, in North Carolina, and I don't know about around the country with it, it just seems that's the way to deal with conflict today, is to go shoot a house up. And you've probably seen some of the stories recently in Wilson and some of the other areas that has experienced the same thing, unfortunately, where a child was hit. So, um, but we're concerned about it. We, the moment that happens, we send our violent incident response team out to that, na to that residence that got shot to knock, to find out who's there, who lives there, what may have caused it and more importantly, where might there be some retaliatory violence as a result of it? Let's go back to the uh, community involvement. Uh, I know we consistently say that uh, dealing with crime is not going to be solved by law enforcement alone. You've got to have the community involved. Do you have any indication as to how many neighborhoods are signing up for Project Safe Neighborhood? Do we have any goals? Or just where are we with that? I don't have that with me, uh, Mr. Mayor. I could get that from um, Jennifer Schneider, and she could she could get, she could provide that information for us. But I, I'm not sure. I do know that we're doing go out making many outreaches to neighborhoods, and we're also starting to engage a lot of the churches. The um, congregate the conversation with congregations I spoke about came directly from the churches. We 
we were setting up many things and asking them to come to us, but at a luncheon that myself and Chief Marsh and some others attended, they said, how about you all come to us rather than we are coming to you? And so we did that and we're just trying to get that information out about the partnership, what we need from the community as it relates to cooperating mainly. Uh, in conversations with the, with the district attorney and the, uh, some of the ADAs, the biggest challenge we're having in solving some of our violent crime is victim and witness cooperation. And so we're just really trying to encourage folks to call 911 uh, and, and, and work with us if you see something or hear something. And we're trying to encourage victims, and sometimes that's a real challenge. You know, may, maybe we need to have a campaign. You know, is your neighborhood involved in Project Safe Neighborhood? Uh, you know, maybe we ought to have some goals in terms of how many neighborhoods we want to sign up. Uh, I just give that some thought. It's, it's one thing to, to go out and as you said, but I think if you've got some targets that you know you want to shoot for, mm -hmm. then you as well as the neighborhoods might be more aggressive in getting involved. I mean, I just got an invitation to a neighborhood, uh, I think sometime in October, October, that they want me to come up because they're getting ready to organize a neighborhood. So I, I just think maybe, maybe we need a stronger campaign uh, encouraging neighborhoods to get involved in Project, project Safe Neighborhood, and maybe, maybe we ought to set some goals. That, you know, this, this is what we like to do. I think that's the goal of, of the Citizen Strong, and I can check with Jennifer okay, Snyder. Okay, well, that's so, fine. I, I might be yeah. asking a question you already got an answer to, but yeah. uh, okay. that's fine. Sure. I uh, recognize Councilman Davis and Councilwoman Katati. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to ask Chief Smith, uh, who is coordinating the, the conversations with congregations? Well, it's coming through uh, um, Jennifer Snyder again with Project Safe Neighborhood. Okay. And she's had several partner churches that have been very involved with her over the last several years. Some aren't but some are. And so those ones that have said, look, we're willing to cooperate and have shown that by their action, what they've done is they, and what we're doing is rather than us going to them with the topic, they, they pick the place, which is generally their church, and they say, this is, can you come this date? And we say yes. Of course, they feed us, which is always good. But um, we ask them, what do you want to know about? And, it, and it's an open discussion. And it, you can ask us anything you want to ask us. And, and it's gone real well. We did the river, we've done Christian assembly, and I think we're, we're gonna be doing one every other month. And they, they invite their congregation to come and, and just have conversation about what's going on. And, and, and there's, everything's on the table. Talk about anything they wanna talk about. That's Councilwoman Katani. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief, for this yes, report, and especially for the clarification. I think that's really helpful. Um, I wanted to raise an issue I saw in the executive summary report. It was on the car seat safety check, and the note was that 89% of the car seats that were checked were incorrectly installed. It's an alarming figure. Are okay. we partnering with anyone or DSS to do some educational outreach? What we do, our, our traffic accident control team has officers that are specifically trained because the reality of it is most people's car seats are not installed properly. And at least a couple of times a year, we do a big education campaign and, and let them know where those officers are. And you can come by and the officer will put your car seat in for you and show you how it's supposed to be put in so it's put in properly. So we, we have officers that are trained to do that and we do that from time to time. Recognize the mayor pro tem. Question, um, Your department participates in the neighborhood college, right? Yes, ma'am. Do you talk about um, Project Safe Neighborhoods or Neighborhood Watch, just getting them involved and using that as a tool? As we do. Well I, to I do that presentation to the City you College and to, and to okay. Neighborhood College. And yes, but it's, we don't have a lot of time. Um, and, but we do. And, and we, we, we enforce that as far as how do you get involved you with the police department. You talk about that? Yes, okay. ma'am. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm willing to yield a minute of my time. I think that's really important. And you're referring to the City College, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yes, okay. I recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you for ex uh, explaining about the aggravated assaults um, because I know that uh, you know, the number's troubling, and I'm sure it's as troubling to you all as it is to us. And it does seem like it's something very hard to get a handle on. And I can also see why it's hard to clear. If you don't know who's doing it and somebody's kind of anonymously shooting into a house, mm -hmm. I can see why that's very hard to clear. Um, and I appreciate what you said about trying to think about how to clear them. Um, 
I think this is the only time, only report since I've been on council that our clearance rates have been below the national average. And as you say, they're better in all the other categories except that aggravated assault category. And uh, at least in terms of the numbers, this is new in the past couple reports. And so appreciate you all trying to get a handle on it. I know it's difficult. Um, I wanted to mention one thing that's not in your report, but I've, I've heard some very complimentary things from several people about how you all handled the the recent uh, situation with the protesters uh, downtown. And I've heard several people say the police handled it with a lot of uh, 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 both appropriate firmness and uh, appropriate patience. And so I just wanted to pass that on. Thank you. How, how are you keeping the medical ve vehicle theft down? I mean, what is it that you all are doing that's improving that situation? Well, quite frankly, Ms. Shull, I'd have to say I think in that particular category we're just fortunate this year. Mm -hmm. but, let, but having said that, let me say this. We did also find out, our crime analysis unit found out about a program up in Alexandria, Virginia. And we found that mopeds are a pretty large percentage of our motor vehicle theft because we have a lot of colleges here and a lot of people ride mopeds. And so what they did, they went in and looked at the density of, of mo moped theft and they, picked out, and they picked out a couple areas that we've let the district commanders know about that, done some education in the area, try to make sure they know their serial number, uh, work with the apartment complexes to try to give them a spot where they can properly secure those mopeds. That's a new program, mm -hmm. and so well, our, we have a great crime analysis unit, and they're always looking for ways that we can deal with issues, and so they, they recognize that if, if we can keep our motor vehicle, our moped mm -hmm. thefts down, we affect our motor vehicle theft as a whole. But that is a new program. I can't say that it's what's caused yes, this. But yeah, that reminds me, and I just I had this in my notes, but I wanted to say again, um, and uh, I know I've, I've mentioned it to Chief Lopez and also to you, Chief, that at some point, uh, if there was a way in which we could pre present to the public uh, one of your comp stat sessions without the, uh, the, the names of people, uh, I just think that the kind of thing you just mentioned is the kind of thing that our public would be very impressed by and the work that that you all are doing at CompStat and the kind of crime analysis that you all are doing and the specificity of the ac of the actions that you're taking district by district and the way you get your captains up and, and the chiefs are questioning them on very, very specific uh, situations, I think is, I, I know it would be difficult, but if there might be a way in which you all could present that. And, and if you can, I, I just think it would be great for our public to see the level of your the, the level of, of uh, kind of brain power that's applied to this. So just want to mention Thank you. We, we have mentioned that to try to do a sanitized comm stat. I think we can, uh, and, and that is something we're, we're talking about doing. I have another question. Uh, on page four of the executive summary, which category would include misdemeanor drug arrests of the type we've been hearing about and discussing lately at city council? I was thinking, would that be under all other offenses? I don't know if you've got that in front of you there, Chief. Uh, on the executive summary, there's a chart. I do have it in front of me. Is, is it? Page four of the executive summary is what I've written down in my notes. Yeah, unfortunately, and mine's, not, mine's not numbered. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, is so. It, is it a blue chart? Does it look like this? Um, is that what it looks like? Okay. Yeah, um, it, yeah that's it. It's, so it would be. Part two offenses, yes. January to June okay. 2014. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, your question was what again? The question is, where would we find the misdemeanor drug arrests of the type that we've been hearing about and discussing lately at City Council? I was thinking it was probably under all other offenses. It, it would be under all okay. other. Of course, you got drug violations there, and it could include that. Okay. Because that doesn't, it just doesn't tell whether it's uh, felony or misdemeanor. Yes, sir. So it probably falls under the drug violations. Okay. Okay. And then. Um, The, just wanted to say that reading the executive summary is, as always, is, is, is sobering. And you all do very difficult work to keep us safe, and it's very much appreciated. Thank you. And I, again, I think if people could read this, they would realize that uh, the detective work, the drug interdiction, and the kind of good old-fashioned police work, I was, in addition to those, I was also impressed by the kind of proactive work on things like getting the apartment security codes together. I mean, there was right. just so much in here, uh, and, and, I, and I appreciated it. Um, and I think those are all my comments, so thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, Steve, I'll Steve, take a break. You, you fooled me. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor said he, was, he, was, he wanted me to talk a little bit longer, Chief Smith. <laughs> 
All right. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize Councilman Marfidens. No, it's okay. I just wanted to follow up on the comment about the, the crime analysis unit. The um, as my colleagues know, and uh, a lot of other people know, the Department of Justice had a team here recently working on gun crime, violent crime, and uh, interviewed many of us. And, but the first thing that the, that the interviewer said, Chief, was he said, I've been over, I've seen the crime analysis unit that you have here, and I just need to tell you that it's one of the best that we've seen. So I appreciate that and um, appreciate the work that they're doing. Well, I can tell you from the Office of the Chief, we recognize that. They do a fabulous job, and they, they, they give us information that sometimes we don't even think about asking for. But that's, that's what you want in a crime analysis unit. They do a great job. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is the General Business and General Public Hearings. Item 21 is Consolidated Annexation for Stonegate Reserve, Case BDG 14000006. Recognize Planning Director Steve Met. Good evening, Steve Medlin with the Durham City County Planning Department. I'd like to first certify for the council that all notifications have been carried out in accordance with law and that affidavits to that effect are part of the case file. This item is three separate actions by City Council related to the annexation of the Stonegate Reserve site. Uh, the subject uh, 3.79 acre site is located on the south side of Stonegate Drive, east of Randolph Road, adjacent to the existing city limits. First, a utility extension agreement has been requested by Garmin Homes LLC to serve the site. The Public Works Department has performed a utility impact analysis and determined that adequate water and sewer services are available. Uh, secondly, a voluntary petition for contiguous annexation has been submitted by the property owner for the site. The Budget and Management uh, Services Department has performed a fiscal, excuse me, fiscal impact analysis based on the proposed use of the site as single-family residential lots. The analysis projects that the estimate revenues will be revenue positive at the time of annexation. And then finally, pursuant to the state law, the City Council is required to apply an initial zoning to the newly annexed area. Staff is recommending an initial zoning of RS20, which is a direct translational zoning from the current county zoning, but also consistent with the City Council's policy designating the least intensive zoning district uh, based on the tier. There are two motions required for this item. First, to conduct a public hearing and receive comments to enter into water, uh, excuse me, utility extension agreement with Garmin Homes LLC, uh, and to adopt an ordinance to annex the 3.791 acres of uh, Stonegate Reserve and establish the RS20 zoning designation. The second motion is to adopt a consistency statement as required by NC General Statute 160A 383. Staff is recommending that the council approve uh, the extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning for Stonegate Reserve, and the associated consistency statement. And I'll be happy to answer any questions council may have. Thank you. You've heard the staff report. This is a public hearing. Uh, declared public hearing to be open. I would ask first other questions by members of the council of the staff report. Hearing none, is there anyone in the audience that wants to speak on this item? This being a public hearing item, no one has signed up to speak, Madam Clerk. Is anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this item? If not, let the record reflect no one else asked to speak. I would declare the public hearing to be closed in my aspect for the council. Second. Second. I thought he said items. Isn't that what you, you said item or item? We'll have to do them Just for clarity's sake, because it's a new statute, I think you can do two separate motions. Um, I know it's a little cumbersome, but we're just not quite sure what the statute, the way the statute reads, you need to do two completely separate motions. Could you help me with the wording, and I would be happy to do the first one. I move that we adopt an ordinance annexing Stonegate Reserve case BDG. 14006 into the city of Durham, effective September 30th, 2014. Um, it needs to be all three component yeah. pieces utility, extension, annexation, and initial. <laughs> to authorize the city manager to make a one time <coughs> debt service payment to the New Hope Volunteer Fire Department to adopt the ordinance amending the United Devel in the Unified Development Ordinance to establish residential suburban RS20 zoning the property and to adopt a consistency statement required by to just, just the first one three. He stopped it. He stopped at the third one, yes. Yeah, he stopped yes, I stopped at the third one, as you know. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Is that it? Second? Uh, it was motion made by Councilman Shules, seconded by the Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, any further questions? If not, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. 
It passes seven to zero. Recognize Councilwoman Katari. Yeah, I move that we adopt a consistency statement as required by NCGS 160A-383. It's been properly moved by Councilwoman Katari, seconded by the Mayor Pro Tem. Any further questions? Hearing none, call the question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Can you hold that, that screen there just for a minute? Yes. Uh, a lot of times I get a question from when I get home, out in the street, whatever. They don't always see all green votes. Can you explain, Madam Clerk, what happens? Yes, if a council member is present and they do not actually push their bu uh, button, button to vote, their vote is counted as a yes. Right. Thank you. We've got time, so I figured I'd fill it a little bit. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, if it's no further, I'm going to close the public hearing. If it's you don't have anything else, uh, the public hearing has been closed again. I recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just well, I had a question for the Deputy City Manager. For the it, uh, several people have asked me, and it was my understanding that we will be discussing the manager's. Human Relations Commission recommendations on Thursday. I hadn't seen it on the work session agenda, but I just wanted to make sure that was going to, uh, that's going to come up for us on Thursday. Yes, sir. It will be scheduled, uh, Mr. Shul, and I'll check to see uh, about the distribution and why that's not been sent to you yet. It okay. certainly should have well, been. It, it, we may, certainly it, will. it may be that it just hadn't been sent yet, but I just was checking in. Yes, sir. Okay, thank we'll you very prepared. much. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. We'll see to it. For German, <laughs> we straight. Any further business come before the council? If not, the council is adjourned at 8:01 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Right. you know, excuse, excuse absent.